Hello, everybody. This is your captain, Charles W. Chuck Bryant. We're flying the friendly skies here in April. Uh, it looks like 2012 with an episode uh, on how air traffic control works. So the seatbelt sign is off. You can recline. You can move about the cabin freely. You can go use that stinky bathroom with a terrible sounding toilet flush if you wish. If I were you, I would hold it. But please, listen to this episode. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, This is Josh Clark. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, Alongside me is Charles W. Chuck Bryant. We're about to take this joint 33,000 feet into the air. About to push some tin. Yeah. That's the lingo. It is. It's, I've seen I assume, pushing tin as well. Yeah, I saw that movie. I assume that's the lingo. Otherwise, they probably would not have titled it thusly. Uh, you could also, that could be about like a car driving movie too. Somebody who has sure. like a pretty good radio flyer wagon. There's a lot of things that that yeah. could apply to. Or a to. recycling movie. Yeah. <laughs> pushing tin. Yes. Uh, we're speaking of the 1999 uh, Mike Newell flick with Billy Bob Thornton and Man, that was a good one. John uh, Cusack. Cusack. Yeah, that's where uh, John Cusack and um, Angelina Jolie met and ended up getting married. You mean Billy Bob Thornton? No, I'm pretty sure it's John <laughs> Cusack. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was very good. Are you kidding? Did you like it? It well, was all right. All right, I have to admit that movies that I thought were awesome in the late 90s, when I go back and watch them now, I'm usually like... Not as great. Yeah, there's yeah. very few that hold up. I'm trying to think of one that I saw again recently that did hold up. I'm going to sit here for a while until I think of it. It wasn't Pushing 10, though. I don't know. I haven't seen it for a while. But well, in the movie, they were uh, air traffic controllers. Yes, and um, that's what we're going to talk about today. So that's, that's right. how Pushing 10 relates to this one. Right? Yes. I thought I'd clear that up in case people were like, what are they talking about again? That, you got any other good air traffic control movies? Uh, well, Airplane. Yeah, of course. Classic. Lloyd Bridges. Looks yeah. like I picked the wrong week to stop <laughs> Stephen Glue. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I have nothing. Oh, what about all the real airport movies? Oh, sure. Yeah. Airport 70, Airport 75, 77. 83, <laughs> 94. Yeah. The years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of the grunge years, I've recently gotten into David Foster Wallace, Uh and I am genuinely sad that he killed himself. He was a good guy. He was a good writer, good guy. Like, from what he shared in his writing, he was pretty cool. Well, I think a late, um, acknowledgement of feeling bad about that is better than nothing at all. Yeah. So welcome aboard that train. Thanks. (laughs) Chuck. Yes. Have you ever been to Reagan National Airport? I know you have, because... Been there with you, my friend. The sickest I've ever seen another human being <laughs> yeah. was you at Reagan National. Oh my God, stomach flu. I, I, people actually get green. I learned from looking at you. And hats off to me for pitching a television show to Science Channel in between vomiting, vomiting episodes. That was rough. You had a staff infection in your stomach. <laughs> I like jumped up and after we pitched the show and like ran to the bathroom and puked and then came back and yeah. was like, "Hey, thanks for the time." Yeah, it was something. <laughs> So that was a bad flight home. Yes. Well, uh, it could have been even worse because had we been flying at night um, about a year ago, last March, sometime between midnight and six, Uh we may have been forced to land at Reagan, DCA, we'll call it, Yeah. um, without the help of any air traffic controller. That is because one night in March last year, 2011, Mm -hmm. um, the one guy who was controlling the tower for all flights at DCA, um, fell asleep and could not be roused. Really? I mean, he was out. Was he drunk? No. Because that happened in Colorado, remember that? Uh, no. There was a drunk air traffic controller that they God, uh, so they pulled from the job. Okay. I know, that's so not cool. No, that is a job where it's like you drug test them every day, <laughs> you, uh, you smell their breath when they come in. Right. You, there's somebody whose job it should be to like clap next to their ears like right. 24 hours. <laughs> the symbols a day. on the job. Yeah. But this guy, no, his, his thing was this is his fourth consecutive overnight shift and, and uh. he was, he couldn't stay awake. Um, so, uh, but apparently other control towers were calling him, right? 
couldn't wake him up. Yeah. They're radioing him, couldn't wake him up. And then they have this system called the shout shout line where, like, you can call somebody in and it goes through the, a PA system really loud. Wow. So they were shouting to wake this guy up. And it's in place for that reason? Yeah. Jeez, that's scary. And, and uh, nothing. Nothing happened. So two different flights landed themselves. And I should say they didn't necessarily land themselves. The uh, brave, valiant people at uh, Traycon, the, yeah. uh, what is it? Uh, the Terminal is... Radar Approach Control yeah. people who are have nothing to do with landing. They took over and helped safely land two planes. Whew. Yeah. It was a scary night. Well, and what you're illustrating there, which is what we'll get into, is that there are a lot of people that get you from point A to point B when yep. you're sitting there enjoying your uh, vodka gimlet. Yes, but not complaining peanuts. Complaining about the peanuts. God help you if you open peanuts <laughs> on a plane these days. They will tackle you. Really? Oh, yeah. People who have peanut allergies. Is that new? Yeah, it's very new. But because it's that like, happened on our it flight. Very seriously. Was it to Austin? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, was on that I had never heard of that before. That's happened to us before. Wow. Is this your first time? <laughs> yep. I just got a text. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and leave that in. All right, well, no. need to show our unprofessionalism. These are free for now. All right, I'm silent. Okay. All right, so you back with me? Yes. Um, I did not know about the peanut thing. I'd never heard of that before. On our flight to Austin, they said, we have someone who's allergic and no one can eat peanuts on the whole flight. Like, don't even open them up. Yeah. And then they served us pretzels that it said on the on the label. Um, these are processed in a plant that also processes peanuts and other nuts. Does it really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't but at least they stuff. weren't peanuts. But that's happened to uh, you, me, and me before on flights where it's like, dude, there's somebody who's so violently allergic to peanuts you wow. can't even open them. Because so. my first reaction was kind of jerky. I was like, well, that's not fair to everyone else. And then I thought, come on. Yeah, right. I don't even care for the peanuts, you know? Yeah. They're not even that good. No, who's, who cares? Um, people who really love peanuts, I'm sure. But I guess what I'm trying to drive at is that's everything there is to know about air traffic controllers. The end. <laughs> Josh, there are approximately 50,000 aircraft operating in U.S. airspace every day. 50,000. So here's the thing. If there's 5,000 in the sky every hour during peak hours. I, I, did you do some math that didn't work out? <laughs> I don't understand this, because think about it. So let's say every hour was a peak hour. Well, they're not. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a peak hour. All right. I guess that's what it is then. But even still, that's crazy. That seems off, but whatever. I'm going to I defer to Freudenrich. <laughs> he has a PhD, and I don't. Although I always wondered what it was in. Who, Craig's uh, the, the author of this article's PhD? Yeah. yeah. We, should, we, should, we can find that out. Okay. Maybe it's, a honor, it's like a Bill Cosby doctorate. <laughs> you know, he's got like 10 of them. He apparently, I used to make fun of Bill Cosby a lot because I think he's an old crank jerk. And um, I got called out once because I was making fun of his doctorates. He apparently has at least one, I think, in education like that he earned. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It wasn't just from a speaking engagement. Well, who am I? My dad has a PhD. So <laughs> we should probably start talking about air traffic controllers, huh? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's actually, I thought this was very cool how it works. Um, and we're going to get into it pretty specifically from, from the time you are sitting on your plane to the time you land and are getting off your plane. And for those of you who like to fly between, say, um, D.C. and Atlanta, this will last approximately about as long as your <laughs> flight will. No, we'll, we'll go through it. All right. Let's start out with uh, airspace. There are 21 zones in the United States airspace yeah. or centers. Each of those zones is divided into sectors, and within each of those zones... Uh, there are portions of airspace about 50 miles, what, in diameter? Yeah. Yeah. And that is called TRACON. TRACON. That is the terminal radar approach control that you talked about. Yeah. And within the TRACON, there are could be several airports, depending yeah. on where you are. Like, for example, if you're in the San Francisco area, you have not one, not two, but three international airports within that TRACON, within just a few miles of each other. And each of those Airports has their own five mile radius of their own airspace, right? But that can overlap. Evidently, are they within five miles? Uh, no, I'll bet you they don't build them within five miles of each other, or that, ten miles if if it's a five mile radius. Yeah, that would make they sense. They can't overlap. So, but uh, this map might not be to scale because it looks kind of cartoony, but it looks <laughs> like they're pretty close. <laughs> it's confusing at the very least. At the very least, there's three international airports within the same tracon. Right. All right. So FAA 
They run the traffic control system. It's a government body. They take care of it all. We'll get to the strike a, a bit later. Oh. You don't want to talk about that? No, I was just excited about talking about it. Uh, we can talk now? No, no, it's Okay. Right. Uh, so there, there are several different um, uh, divisions, and we'll go over those now uh, so you know what we're talking about here when you take off, and you'll know who's handling you at any given moment. Yeah, and it's all pretty intuitive. Sure, it makes sense. Uh, Freud and Rick used a really good um, analogy, I thought, that just completely clears any misunderstanding whatsoever up. It's all very much just like a zone defense. Yeah. You just, as your plane is moving, it gets handed off from one person to another person to another person as your plane crosses through the airspace. We could really stop there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's not. Okay, Division One uh, Air Traffic Control System Command Center, uh, ATCSCC. They oversee the whole ball of wax and uh, manage control within the centers uh, when, when there's problems. So I, I get the impression that these guys are like the cream of the crop. Yeah. Like, they're like, you, you've got some pretty bad weather here. I'm just going to go ahead and take over your controls and handle this for you. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. I got that idea. Um, they have, uh, next is the Air Route Traffic Control Centers, and there is one ARTCC for each center, and they manage traffic within all sectors of that center, except for that 50-mile Tracon zone. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. These are the ones where it's kind of like... You're on the boonies. Okay. Like, I get the impression that Tracon airspace is, like, um, a little urban. Yeah. Like, they're saying, like, there's actual airports here. There's enough this action. Is like, this is just over the over the Great Plains. Okay. There are the air traffic, uh, air route traffic control centers. All right. Then you got your terminal radar approach control, which is what we've been talking about, the 50-mile zone that handles the, you know, flights leaving and coming into the airport. Mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the air traffic control tower. You've all seen those. Yeah. And everyone probably thinks that that's all there is going on is just the tower. That's just one little piece of the puzzle. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that's basically like, it's almost like you can look at it as an expanded version, right? Sure. So an airport has its own control tower. Yeah. A few airports will share a Tracon. Yeah. And then if you expand out further geographically, you run into air route traffic control centers. Yeah. And then if you look at the United States as a whole, you've got the air traffic control system command center. Well done. Thanks. It's like uh, the power of 10, the Eames documentary. Yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> uh, and then finally, you have the flight service station, the FF, uh, FSS, and that um, provides information for private pilots um, flying out of like, you know, Charlie Brown Airport here in DeKalb County. Yeah, and if you're a small pilot, you're um, allowed to fly by um, visual flight rules, which means you use your peepers. Yes. Um, and if you use your peepers to fly, you don't have to file a flight plan, and you are basically guided by um, a flight service station. Right. Um, if you happen to fly a plane that has, I don't know, like 200 people in back, you're flying what's called uh, instrument flight rules, which means you can fly in any weather. Yeah. Because you're using radar. Um, there's usually a psychic aboard who is um, <laughs> asked to give uh, weather predictions, things like that. Right. Um, and you are directed by this whole FAA run ball of wax, like you said. This whole quote unquote FAA. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I remember when uh, Kennedy Jr. died, he was. Um, wouldn't it, he was not instrument rated? Wasn't that the deal? Oh, is that right? I think so. I think he was just um, a visual uh, VFR rated, and they said that he shouldn't have been flying in that weather oh, that's unless right. was he was instrument weather. rated. Yeah. Yeah. It was very sad. It was. Um, okay, so let's say you're flying um, Jacob. This is Jacob Silverman, right? No, this is Freud and Rick. Oh, it was? Silverman wrote the medical marijuana one. Okay, that's next. <laughs> or... In three weeks, you never know. <laughs> um, let's say you're flying from New York to San Francisco. Yeah. There are going to be seven different portions of that flight, starting with pre-flight and ending in your landing. True that. What's in between? Oh, well, you've got takeoff. Sure. You have departure. Yeah. You have en route, which is uh, synonymous pretty much with cruising. Sure. That's my favorite Cruising time. altitude. Yeah. Uh, or vodka gimlet time for you. <laughs> Uh, and then you have descent. Yeah, uh, folks, we have just made our initial descent. Yeah, wake up. Yeah, um, turn off your stuff. Yeah, 
uh, approach, and then uh, you've got, well, like you said, landing. Yeah, you know what else they call descent is uh, sky mall time. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because you got to turn off all your stuff that you're passing the time with, and all of a sudden you're like, eh, I guess I'll read the sky mall magazine. I make a second or third concerted effort to go back to sleep. It's like, hey, we're 500 miles out. We're making our initial yeah. descent. We're not going to be there for another hour, but I want to talk to you. Yeah. It's it's like, yes, we all sensed it in our inner ears. Just go back to flying the plane. Yeah, Emily gets annoyed with the descent that she can't get up and pee any longer. Yeah. Well, and, you can really. Well, yeah, she did it on, in Austin. Got in, they're, you know, they always say, like, you should sit back down. And she's like, do you want me to pee all over right, this plane? Exactly. You don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they will not move. They can't move. If the, if you're stuck on the, the tarmac. Mm-hmm. On a runway or something? Yeah. And you have to get up and go to use the bathroom. If you can go, the plane can't move because you have everybody has to have their seatbelts buckled and you must held the plane up for Oh really? <laughs> yeah. So hey, sometimes you just have you to You gotta go, you gotta yeah. go, man. Luckily I've never been in that situation where you're like you hear people saying like I was on the tarmac for like three hours. Yeah. I, I would I lose it, man. Go ahead and knock on wood. I would get off. I would be like they'd have to air marshal me out of can there. Get off. Oh sure you can. Oh. All you gotta do is say the right things. And then all of a sudden you're being escorted off. Right, but then you're off and then off to jail. Uh not necessarily. No, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. At the very least you're gonna be detained for the rest of the day. I'd rather be in jail. See, that is jail. Sitting on a tarmac on a plane with all those people is jail to me. Jail does not have Go Magazine. That's true. Okay. Pre-flight, Josh. What's going to happen here? You're on your plane. You're feeling good. You've ordered your drink or taken your pill. You're trying to fall asleep. I I don't take pills anymore. Are you good to go? I am. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, Your pilot is going to be doing some important things, which don't include drinking, hopefully. (laughs) They're going to be checking over your plane. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Uh, they're going to file the uh, flight plan 30 minutes prior. Yeah, which, so a flight plan, I always thought, like, I would never want to be a pilot. Flying a, a Filing a flight plan, plan sounds terrible, right? Yeah. And then upon reading this article, I'm like, that's the flight plan, really? So basically, can I tell them what a flight plan yeah, is? Yeah, what do you think it was? Oh, I thought it was, like, this detailed, like, chart route, like, <laughs> here we're going to just move to the left just slightly, and then we're going to go oh, up no, over no, this no. mountain and then back down. Yeah. No, a flight plan is the airline's uh, name and flight number, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the kind of uh, aircraft it is. Yeah. Uh, what you intend to fly at, altitude and speed-wise. Sure. And then, um, you know, which way you're going. That's the, it. The route, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, now I'm kind of like, sure, I'll be a pilot. Yeah, that's but what you got to do. Really. I don't think I'd want to, to log that kind of travel. Well, no, of course you wouldn't. Um and the reason that they, it is probably that minimal is because they want the pilot to be flying the plane and concentrating on that while the men and women in the control centers handle all the other stuff. Right. Like we'll get into right now. Yeah. So you've got the uh, flight data person who says, hey, this flight plan looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to print out a strip that has to do with, um, you know, your – well, basically, I think there's like 21 different little uh, pieces of information. Oh, really? Yeah, that any air traffic controller can look at and say, oh, uh, based on this, this guy should be here right now. Okay. If anything happened. So the flight flight progress strip is what – it, when you have a flight, like it's, it stays with your flight the whole time. It gets passed off between person and person. And changed as needed. Yes. And this is all, to begin with, filed with the uh, FAA host computer. So before they can do anything, it's got to be in the mainframe. Well, the host computer is the one that gives, that spits out the, the progress. Okay. Yeah. So they file the flight plan and then it spits out yeah. the route. Yeah. Probably cool. like, oh, you're going this route? Well, then this weather's here and you got to look out for ducks over here and <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing I learned too, there are uh, regular ascending and descending corridors that I think they just are typical for that airport, not typical, but used for that airport. Yeah. So they're not just like, hey, why don't you fly out this way today? Yeah. It's uh, really neat if you fly into Hartsfield here in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, world's busiest airport. Mm-hmm. Um, 
when you're flying, when you're coming in for a landing, yeah. there's a whole row that stretches back for 10 miles mm-hmm. of planes that are coming in right behind you. That's the so corridor. Cool. Yeah. And, but if you look over to your left or your right, there's like three or four of them at any given time, three or four of these lines wow. of planes all flying into Hartsfield. Yeah, I didn't realize they lined them up like that, but when they're coming, you got 10 planes com- coming in, you're just like, all right, get in line. Yeah. And there's a certain, the corridors, you, you come in at a certain altitude, like a right. certain corridor is like, oh, you come in at this altitude, a different corridor comes in at a higher altitude. It's, it's all very exact. Yes. Thank God. <laughs> this is good. Uh, so you, you have your approved uh, flight plan, you've got your little progress uh, strip, and your flight data person's going to say, clearance delivery, and the pilot's going to finish up his drink. Uh, or her drink. <laughs> you think that's so funny, <laughs> don't you? I do. And they're going to give that strip to the ground controller in the tower. So now the ground controller is in possession of of your of your junk. <laughs> right. <laughs> because that's how they get pilots to land, to ensure that they're going to come back, <laughs> is by hanging onto their junk while they're gone. That's right. Uh, they are responsible for the ground traffic, uh, taxing, all that stuff, making sure planes in that huge parking lot down there aren't running into each other. Yeah, that seems like a that's a that's a big one. Oh yeah. The ground controller might have the most frenetic job. Because Probably, yeah, maybe so. Everybody else it's like here's a plane that's landing and yes you have to keep up with the distance between other planes and you're managing several planes but you're managing them in a corridor. Right. This guy's got like all sorts of crazy stuff going on with planes trying to get out and sure. get into the runway system and especially at a Hartsfield. Yeah. Yeah, like you can't just say yeah, just go ahead and pull across runway 10 there to runway 12, and you'll be fine. you got to make sure there's nothing yeah. taxing around or landing, obviously. And I believe the ground controller is one of only two air traffic controllers that are allowed to use binoculars. The local controller and the ground controller are the only yeah. ones that can use binoculars, which is pretty cool. Like, these guys strike me as, like, early NASA dudes who, like, put put men on the moon. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they wear, like, uh, short button-down yellow shirts with brown ties, and, like, mm-hmm. they have big forearms, and, like, maybe they have vaguely, like, uh, military haircuts. Yeah, Those they are all, the guys. They look like Ed Harris in uh, Apollo 13. That's who I was describing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you're taxing to the runway. The ground controller is watching all this stuff. Um, this is all transmitted by radio initially, and like they say, all right, get on channel whatever, 13, Mr. Pilot, or Mrs. Pilot, and we will direct you to the, or Ms. Pilot, Mm -hmm. excuse me, and we will direct you to the (laughs) correct uh, runway. Right. And then I will pass that off to the local controller. Here, now now this plane is yours. And the local controller is the one who is keeping an eye on distances between planes and um, basically making sure that the sky is clear for takeoff. They're in the tower. Yep. Yeah. And they're the ones who say, pilot, you are clear for takeoff. And the pilot says, okay, but I'm going to check myself first. Looks both ways and goes, okay. <laughs> and when the pilot's ready, the pilot powers up and lifts off. And you've got the uh, local controller hanging on to the, the uh, that particular flight. Yeah. Um, while, of course, managing other flights as well. Um for, I think, five miles out. Yeah. But before they reach that five-mile point, the local controller, and now, so we're leaving the um, the control tower at the airport, and mm-hmm. we're expanding out to Tracon yeah. as they hand off to a uh, radio controller at Tracon, That's the right. departure controller, I That's believe. That's right. All right, so now we're in the air. We are uh, on route, and you have to, if you're a pilot, activate your transponder, which will um, basically make you the little blip on the radar. Very important thing to do. Yeah. That's that's how they can follow you as you move across the country or around the world. <laughs> right? You are covering all bases <laughs> on this episode. Well, your little blip is going to um, obviously represent your plane, and it's going to have your flight number, your altitude, your airspeed, and your destination. Mm-hmm. And uh, so where are we now? It's also how they find you if you go plummeting into the ocean or the earth. Sure. Is that the black box? Uh, I think that's probably a part of the transponder. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the departure controllers at Tracon may be handling a few different airports, many, many planes, and uh, they also are the ones maintaining good safe distances, which is very yeah. important. That's pretty much um, because of the increase in congestion and in air traffic over the last, like, 40 years. Yeah. 
um, that's like job one of any air traffic controller is you have so many planes that basically you want to keep them evenly spaced sure. following these prescribed corridors. Yeah. And um, if you can do that, then you can do this safely. That's right. So what do you what do we have? Where are we on route yet? Are we? Uh, yeah. Once you leave the Tracon airspace, which is the fifty miles, then they pass you off to the center controller, which is the ARTCC. Yep. And um, so we're expanding out again. Expanding out, and it's important to note every time you get passed along, they're going to pass along an updated progress slip that says, "Yeah, we thought they were going to be actually about fifty miles uh, further west. Yeah. But because of bad weather, or whatever, we altered their flight path, and so." Here's what you need to know. Right. Or um, they were uh, they hit some headwind, so right. they're a little further back. There's hauling butt through the air. Yep. Which are my favorite flights. And so these guys in the um, the radar associate controller and the radar controller yeah. at the uh, air route traffic control centers, the rural ones, the mm-hmm. regional ones, they um, are the ones who say, well, they're just tracking your plane throughout it's flight, right? But then they're also directing it to say, um, like, there is some weather up ahead. There's some turbulence, right? We, you, we advise you to increase your altitude. Um, and then, as they pass through air traffic, uh, air route traffic control center, after air route traffic control center, um, your plane is just going to be passed off from one controller to another. Here you go, Bobby. Right. Thanks, Jimmy. I wonder what they say. I think that's what they say. I don't think that's what they <laughs> No. Say. It's probably a little more technical than that. Um, and then there's also a radar handoff controller, and they assist the uh, the two other controllers when there's a lot of heavy traffic. They'll, they'll come in and say, hey, let me, let me lighten the load here a little bit. Which is significant. So you've got three controllers all working together. Two of them are assisting the radar controller. You have the radar associate controller who alerts the radar controller that they have new stuff, and then the radar handoff controller is basically just looking over both of their shoulders like, don't forget that one. Right. (laughs) Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. I like that one. That's red. Look out, that one's going right towards that one. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope that doesn't happen very often. No. Remember, that was in Pushing 10, though. Yeah. Very tense. Well, because they were all a a flitter over Angelina Jolie. Oh, is that what caused that? Yeah, they weren't paying attention to their jobs. Gotcha. Because they were concentrating on that leg. It's like uh, Bull Durham. Emily was just watching that today in her sick bed. Weird. Yeah. It's very weird. Good movie. All right. So this is all going on until you're about 150 miles out um, from your destination. And then the center controller will uh, jump on board and do what you were talking about earlier and get everyone coming in in a nice, tidy little line yep. for landing. Like from 10 miles out. Like when you were 10 miles away from the airport. Now, this is 150 were- miles out. Oh, okay. They, they they start to get them in line. So then you haven't hit Tracon airspace yet, have you? No. Okay. Th- that's the next stop as you go back into someone else's Tracon. Following these prescribed corridors. And these things are not just like easy straight lines. Like they're really, you know how like when you fly up, you're like, wait, we're going the wrong way. And then your pilot banks hard. Mm-hmm. And then you go back. That's a corridor. And you're going, whoa. Yeah. They yeah. curve like that corridors too. It's really neat. Um, and uh, we should mention, too, if there's something wrong and it's too congested or your runway is, uh, is not working, like the lights are off, like an airplane, <laughs> yeah. uh, they will put you in the, in the dreaded holding pattern, yeah. which is not, hey, just fly around up there for a while. It's specific to each airport. You know what the holding pattern is, and you stay there. Yeah. And I, I think it's, isn't it like a big circle, or it, does it vary? <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. All right, so now you are within uh, 50 miles. Tracon's got a hold of you again. Um, they are advising the pilot on heading, speed, altitude. And then when you're 10 miles out, the ap- approach controller passes you back to the local controller, and it's all just a big, glorious dance. Yep. And then you land, and the local controller says, hey, uh, go out this way, and you do. And the ground controller takes over. And then you are directed via the ground controller to your gate. And that's it. And then once you get to the gate, obviously, you have the, uh, the men and women with the orange flashlights. They are airline employees, not FAA. I did not realize that until I read this. Once I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, they're all wearing like Delta or AirTran or something yeah, like that. So, true. Yeah. All right. So I know you want to be an air traffic controller, Josh. How would you go about that? 
Well, I would go uh, study very hard at school mm-hmm. and earn a bachelor's degree, four-year degree. Which you don't need. Oh, uh, Or you could work somewhere for three years. Yeah, it's actually one of the higher-paying jobs you can get without a college degree, they oh, say. Nice, Chuck. Yeah. Um, I would also probably focus on my um, spatial, vis- vi- spatial visualization yeah. uh, skills so I could visualize things in three dimensions. Yeah. Work yeah. on your concentration. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Is that what you were doing? Yeah. It's all creepy. Uh, like we said, you were employed by the FAA, and you have to apply through the federal civil, uh, civil service system. Pass a test that is, I read an article from a, a guy that was on Wall Street, very stressful job, and he decided, I'm going to go be an air traffic controller because yeah. I just I dig this stuff. Yeah. And uh, he said the test is timed and very, very hard. So Good. They, they want to put the pressure on you. Oh, it should be. And the clock is ticking. Good. Yeah. Uh, 3D uh, spatial visual, uh, visualization on the exam, reasoning, abstract reasoning. It's like, it's tough stuff. Yeah. So... They say, all right, you can be a trainee. You're going to move to Oklahoma City for seven months, and not many of you are going to make it through training. We're going to call the majority of you. Right. So know that going in. Yep. You might not get through. Right. Because they want the cream of the crop. But then let's say you did, and then what happens? Then you go, uh, you know, you walk up in front of an airport with your resume. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. And say, can I start landing flights? Yeah, um, pretty much. You uh, st- you start working, and then uh, I guess to become uh, certain kinds of air traffic controllers. Right. Like I think Traycons um, or the uh, air route traffic control centers, the regional ones, um, you have to be certified. Yeah, for each little different job. Yeah. Yeah. And then as you get better and better, you move up and up, and then all of a sudden you realize like you're the president of the United States. <laughs> Uh, you can make uh, the average starting pay twenty eight bucks an hour. Is that right? Not bad. So it's not salaried, huh? Uh, well, it gets to be salaried at a certain point, I think. Um, the average starting pay? Yeah, that's good money. Yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, controllers can earn um, up to and over a hundred thousand per year after just a few years. They say. Wow. But you're gonna be working long shift duties. You're gonna be working on Christmas, maybe working from midnight to eight a.m. Sometimes. It's in ten- midnight to six. It's intensely stressful. What do you mean midnight to six? That's a, sh- that's a shift. Oh, I thought they were eight-hour shifts. I think they're six-hour shifts. Oh, well, they've cut that back then, which is good. Yeah. Because one of the things in 1981, when they went on strike, they were lobbying for was reduced shift hours. Well, what happened when they all went on strike? <laughs> do you know about this, or are you being coy? I, I, I mean, vaguely. Uh, well, they went on strike in August, uh, and they wanted better wages. They wanted a 32-hour work week. Because remember, these are FAA employees. Yeah. So they're federal civil servants. Which is a big problem because you're not allowed to go on strike if you're a union, federal union uh, member. Is that right? Yeah. So they violated the law. Uh, Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, ordered them back to work, said, you got to go back to work right now. That was, that was I didn't even try to do Reagan. They should try it again. <laughs> No. <laughs> Do Nixon doing Reagan? <laughs> no. No. Uh, only 1,300 of the 13,000 went back to work. He says, you've got 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That was much better. And then uh, in 48 hours, uh, they uh, did not come back to work. And he says, you know what? All 11,000 plus of you are fired. 11,700. By, by me. Yeah. The president. I'm firing all of you. <laughs> so crazy. And he did. Yeah. And uh, they had to cut the flights back to... A, 50% for a while, and uh, they were also banned from any federal service for life, but Clinton rescinded that. And then uh, they say it took a full decade to restore the program back to its original staffing numbers. Wow, that's crazy. Although they got up and running and, you know, doing the best they can within a few years. It seems a little rash, but the but Gipper that, sent his message. That ain't what you want striking, man. No, I agree. But, wow. Yeah, Something. you're you're all fired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I thought it was uh, always one of the top stressful jobs, but the list of 2012 doesn't have it in the top 10. Really? Well, let's hear that list. Oh, you want to hear it? Yeah. Uh, number 10, cab driver. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Don't go this way. Go that way. Don't take third. Take fourth. What are you doing, stupid cabbie? Don't huh. you take credit cards? That's more stressful than air <laughs> traffic control. I don't know. Uh, number nine, photojournalist. 
I guess, in you know, war torn countries. Right, sure. Yeah. Um, or on safari. Yeah. Those are dangerous too. That's true. Uh, number eight, CEO, like big corporate exec. <laughs> number seven, PR executive. Double. <laughs> really? Yeah. Who made this list? Uh, it's the list. I don't know who makes it. All right. Um, number six, event coordinator. <laughs> like uh, the wedding planners I, and stuff I, like that. Yeah. It's stressful. You got to deal with those crazy bridezillas. Uh, no? Jerry snickered at that. Okay. Um, number five, cop, of course. Yeah. Number four, army general or military general. This thing was put together by a six-year-old boy and girl <laughs> combination. <laughs> I'll bet it was originally written in crayon. <laughs> number three, cowboy. No. You're kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, number, three is, number three is actually airline pilot. Number two is firefighter, and number one is enlisted soldier. Yeah. So there you have it. No <laughs> air traffic control, which I think is a bit hinky. I think that list is hinky. I do too. Podcasters know we're on there. Sure. I'm so stressed out right now. That's got to be top 15. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you got anything else? I don't. Oh, we already talked about the movies. Uh, <laughs> mentioned the article's author. Yeah, I think we're good. Uh, if you want to know more about air traffic control, you can type that into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also listen to the companion piece uh, to this episode, How Air Traffic Control Works, at Tech Stuff. Their episode is called How Traffic Control Works. Check it out. Oh, they did one? See who did it better. I'm sure they did. I believe they did. Okay. Um, And I think in there somewhere I said search bar, handy search bar or the like. So it's time for listener mail. I know this because Chuck has it in his own hand. Yeah. I'm going to call this one. um, Our listener ratted us out to Michael Moore. Did you see this? This just came in. Oh, no. Awesome. Remember in the tipping podcast, we said Michael Moore yeah. re- reportedly was a bad tipper? Some people wrote in and, and uh, verified their with their own stories, too. Not about Michael Moore, though, did they? Yeah. It? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me that first. I didn't see that one. I, I'm not at liberty to divulge this, but I can tell you that at least two other people have said, like, yeah, that guy is not only not a good tipper, he's not, like, he's not. He's not all that? Yes. Wow. All right. Well, I felt bad for a half a second because um, Ian uh, of Brooklyn, New York, tweeted Michael Moore, asked about his tipping habits um, by saying this. Hey, did you know the guy stuff you should from Stuff You Should Know called you out as a notoriously bad tipper last week? Say it ain't so. So he totally ratted us out. Uh-huh. Um, and then Michael Moore uh, direct messaged him back and said, Ha ha, no, but I'll add that to all the great fiction I've collected about myself. For the record, I always leave between 25 and 33%. That is, that is in the face of what we've been hearing. <laughs> we got to clear this up somehow. I know, and then I felt bad because I didn't see those other emails. And I said, hey, listen, dude, tell, the, tell Michael Moore that we were, we were sort of uh, suspicious about this and that we'll clear it all up on the show. But I guess we just did. We just muddied the water even further. And Ian of Brooklyn said, can I also hear Chuck reenact his exasperated what? It's had me cracking up all week. So there you have it. What? <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty lame reenact. What's he looking for, Josh? Um... What? No. Something along those lines? What? Which a what? What? There it is. Okay. That's, That's kind of yours to begin with, but yeah. actually it was Fred Willard's to begin with, wasn't it? Oh, uh. From Best in Show? No, what? I got it from The Simpsons. Oh, okay. Mo Sislak is really good at what? Ugh. What? That guy. Yeah, he's good. Um, so I guess that's it. Yeah, Michael Moore. Good tipper or not, we shall never know. Yeah, we'd like to hear from you if you happen to listen to this. Um, if it's cool with you, we'll just show up and follow you around with the camera for a week and watch you tip. But don't try to put on any show for us, okay? 33%? I thought that was a little inky. Chuck, Chuck, is, uh, Chuck is mentioning our tweet, uh, our Twitter handle, SYSK Podcast. Man, that was just grammatically all over the place, wasn't it? Sure. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter 
by following our Twitter handle, SYSK Podcast. You can also check us out on Facebook at facebook.com. And uh, if you, you know what? I'm sure everybody has a crazy plane flight, plane story, flight story. So just come up with something other than that. Uh, you can email us at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.